Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 15th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning, now from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, we start with a brief discussion about a new information paper on the PFD from the legislature's Legislative Finance Division. And then we turn to our top three issues. They're these. First, our growing concern with Mike Dunleavy's budget numbers. They just don't add up. Second, why that concern leads us to focus even more on the Senate District O race between incumbent Peter Machecki and challenger Ron Gillum. And third, why Jared Kushner's use of tax loopholes matters to the fiscal policy debate. And now, let's join Michael. Um, so we're going to talk about our weekly top three today. Anything new you want to share with the Facebook audience here in the next minute or so before we jump into it? Yeah, I'm going to post later today a, uh, a paper that Ledge Finance recently posted on their website that just sort of stuns me. Uh, this is legislative finance. This is the this is the advisor to the legislature down in Juneau. And the first line of it, this is from Ledge Finance. The first line is, dividends are government expenditures and money for dividends competes with money for education, Medicaid, and other government services. That's just the first line. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Holy cow. So uh, you wonder you wonder why Juno is the way it is. This is this is who the legislature pays to advise it. They're putting out stuff like this. I want to know who's on, who is that? I mean, I want to know put, give me some names. I want some names as to who authored that report. Right well, there. David, David, David Teal's the head of Ledge Finance. That you know, uh, um, that's astonishing. It is. I mean, it, there's not even there's not even it, there's eight points, eight bullet points. As I say, I'll post it up later. There's eight bullet points. Not not one of them is is something that I just my jaw didn't drop at. I mean, it, dro it dropped for every one of them. So it's um, I, I, I mean, and so this is what legislators get from the the advisors that. What they're told is their advisor. This is what they get when they get down to Juno. Well, and you wonder why government screw. We are jumping back into it now. Our weekly, our weekly discussion with our good friend Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, he's got quite a background: uh, oil, gas, uh, economics. Uh, you know, just a little bit of everything in there, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we love talking to him each and every day i don't know why that's going on here uh each and every week uh, rather and we're going to talk to him about uh today his weekly top three which are the top three stories that he really wants to dig into that he think affect alaska and beyond uh, so he joins us now good morning brad how are you michael i'm doing absolutely great this morning i hope you are as well i'm doing good you know it's just another beautiful day in paradise my friend so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about your weekly top three. Although I think your teaser that you just gave us right before you jumped on is good. If you want to give that again, I think people need to hear this. Well, it's uh, uh, I I was working on my uh, uh, posts for the day. I post I regularly post a PFD uh, related post and and one related to national issues during the day on uh, on our blog and on our, in our on our Facebook pages, social media pages. And I was working on today's and I happened to be over in the legislative finance uh, division uh, page uh, or the legislative finance division section. This is the, this is the group that advises the legislature once they get to, Jun to Juneau on fiscal matters. 
and they've recently published uh, in the last couple of weeks. I think it's how, that's how long I've been on or since I've been on. They recently pub published a paper that says the impact of permanent fund dividends, PFDs on defi deficits, takeaway points. The first, very first sentence uh, in that paper, in their eight bullet points, the very first sentence says, dividends are government expenditures, and money for dividends competes with money for education, Medicaid, and other government services, period. <laughs> I, I just I'm so blown away. I'm just I am totally, totally blown away by that. I mean, just so, the, the, that very idea. So if we wonder if we wonder why Juno is the way it is, this is who legislators, when they show up down there, are right. told to pay attention to uh, as as being the go to people, the people that know everything uh, on government finance matters. And the first sentence that 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 ledge finance is leading with in, in this paper on pfds is that dividends are government government expenditures and money for dividends competes with money for education medicaid and government services uh, here here's a here's another sentence therefore every dollar appropriated for dividends is a dollar diverted from the general fund which is used to pay for government services oh my god <laughs> My head is going to explode. I mean, again, uh, I don't know if listeners to this show with any for any length of time understand. I mean, with, except for two years ago when they made a change, dividends were never calculated as government expenses or uh, you know income or expenses. They it was a pass through. It was like a federal pass through. You don't count a federal pass through as income in and income out. It's just a pass through, and that's what the dividends used to be until a couple of years ago when when they changed how they accounted for it, and all of a sudden it was income and expenditures. This is part of a narrative. Uh, we could unpack a whole show on this one thing alone. Maybe we should do that. Maybe Brad, we should we should do a special podcast and go over these eight points and debunk them and just rip them to shreds. Because I got to tell you, I'm starting to get a little pissed off about that. That is that is making me angry right now. So well, well don't don't read the whole thing. Uh, check your blood pressure then. Before oh my you read god! The whole thing because. Because all eight points will do that. It, I mean, it'll just be a cumulative effect, a building effect. I, Mike, I'm going to have blood shooting out of my eyes before <laughs> the thing is over. So maybe we should do that. Maybe we should do a special podcast and and get it out there for folks and uh, and debunk this this thing piece by. I mean, it just it sounds like trash. So anyway, we'll we'll jump into that. But let's talk about <laughs> before I get really wound up. Man, I can just feel my uh, little palpitations going on there. Let's talk a little about. Uh, about your uh, your weekly top three, and I'm so agitated. I accidentally closed the window with a list of your top three <laughs> in it. I just, I mean, I'm just my brain just shut off. I'm just so just just ack. What the actual hell was somebody thinking when they wrote that? Apparently, they're thinking that this is how, what everybody's all down with. So let's talk a little bit about the gubernatorial race. Uh, of course, the three candidates are there, but you've expressed some concern about uh, the Republican front runner. Uh, Mike Dunleavy, who is uh, leading by all polls that I've seen, and including some newest polling data, he still maintains his lead. But you are still concerned about some of the numbers that he has bandied about in his budgeting, his final year budget, and everything else. Let's talk a little bit about that as your number one. Yeah, and and that concern, I I don't mean to pick on Mike. He is the front run, front runner, and if the polls if the polls are an indication, he is going to be our governor. And what I what what is really beginning to bother me a lot is the fact that that we're not going to match what's going on during the campaign uh the rhetoric that's going on during the campaign with the reality that's going to hit uh if he's elected i think one of the things politicians really need to do is they need to use campaigns as an educational opportunity and as a support building exercise uh to to, to sort of give them a wave uh, when they when they are elected uh, to to govern, I mean, give them public support for the actions they're going to have to take uh, when they govern. I'm I'm, and and what Mike needs to be doing, what he said he was going to be doing up until this campaign started, up until, uh, up well, up until the end of the primary, what he said he was going to do is he was going to be come in and make big cuts in spending, and get the the ship's fiscal state uh, righted. Uh, by bringing spending down to to levels that uh, traditional revenues could support, um, and 
and and that's controversial because you know the first question everybody asks is what are you going to cut if you're going to cut my program right uh then then i oppose you but but campaigning on that would have prepared everybody for what he's going to for what what the reality he's going to face once he's elected he's not doing that i mean he's 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 sort of i, I don't I don't mean to use this word pejoratively, but he's sort of like the candy man. He's sort of giving everybody uh, what they want. So, so here, here's the basis of the concern, and then, and then what, what has triggered this additional concern uh, on top of that. The basis for the concern is this: he, so far, in the campaign, he said that he favors that he thinks he can get it down, get us down to a 4.3 billion dollar operating budget. Now, sometimes on this program and others. He talks about that being a four billion number, but what he said in the press, what he said in public, is four point three billion, plus a full PFD, plus no taxes, plus you've got to have some room in there for a capital budget. So let's assume that he's talking about you know what what really is a minimal capital budget, two hundred million dollars. So that brings you up to a four point five billion dollar budget with a full PFD and with no taxes. And what you need to layer on top of that is the need to refill the CBR. Right. I mean, we, we've, we've taken the CBR down to nothing, our fiscal reserve down to nothing. So we are we are not prepared for the next for the next downturn. And 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 if you if you follow the national news, the international news, people are already talking about the next global downturn coming uh, in the in 2020, which is just a year away. Um, so we have to refill the CBR, not immediately, but we need to have a plan for refilling the CBR. And, and, and so you have to layer that on top. There is no way, no way that the budget numbers, that's the traditional revenue levels, um, support that. Uh, at, 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 uh, Suzanne Downing and others have made a big point that we're now at $80, so now we have a, a balanced budget. We don't. Uh, we have about not, not the way Dunleavy is looking at it. We don't have a balanced budget because we're that that eighty dollars and and the claim that we have a balanced budget still depends on on diverting a portion of the PFD revenues over to government over to government spending, cutting the PFD in order to support government spending to get it balanced. We don't actually get to a fully balanced budget with a full PFD until we get to eighty five dollars. And then when you layer CBR, the need to refill the CBR on top of that, you actually don't get to a fully balanced budget until we're at $100 a barrel oil. And we're, we're a long way away from that. So the, the, it, we, it, as long as Dunleavy's talking about $4.3 billion as an operating budget, and you layer on the minimal capital budget, it's $4.5 billion. His numbers just don't work. We, 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 it, it, we're not going to have a manageable budget situation uh, uh, under him uh, if that if that's where he's going. So he's been talking. We've had these conversations. You've had these conversations with him. He's sort of con come down to four billion dollars. You 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 laid on the three point seven five billion dollars in your last conversation with him that you and I have talked about. Right. He sort of sort <laughs> of uh, he, he nestled uh, up against it. I mean he you know he didn't full wholeheartedly embrace it, but he said yeah that's really where we need to be. But but then uh, there's a there's a report in uh, K2 uh, public media uh, uh, a story from um, uh, Kitcheman I would guess no I think from it's, Tim Ellis oh, okay uh, in the in the October 12th K2 uh, KTOO uh, public media that talks about uh, that talks that, that, that all three candidates appeared to public forum down you know and and here's what the report said now this is Dunleavy. Who says we have to cut costs, right? Uh, who says we have to get it down at 4.3, but he really has to get it down to 3.75 to make all parts of his of his budget work. Here's, but here's what the report says: All three candidates also said they'd restore funding for the travel industry association's marketing efforts that the legislature had reappropriated, in other words, cut over the past few years. <laughs> the funding, which comes from a tax on rental. Vehicles fell from 16 million in FY 23, 2013, to 1.5 million last fiscal year after Walker vetoed part of the appropriations. Both challengers said that, that so we're talking about Dunleavy and Baggage. Both challengers said they protect tourism, marking funding from future reappropriations cuts. Um, and then in another part, Dunleavy's talking about um, they're talking about uh, capital expenditures and. Uh, 
Dunleavy agrees that we need additional capital expenditures for infrastructure, for roads and ports and and tourist related uh, facilities. So at the very time that we need to be preparing Alaskans for deeper budget cuts, we got Mike out there on the road talking about budget increases. Um, and it's just it, 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 we are not he's this is not the way to handle a campaign to get Alaskans ready for. Uh, uh, for what has to come uh, in the in the in the next years, this is more like the Parnell Road Show. Of everybody's happy, we're all fine. Don't worry about it. Yes, oils dropped from $120 down to $80 uh, during 2014, and yes, that's probably going to be a problem. But don't worry about it. We can keep all this all this spending going and and keep PFDs. Well, we couldn't. We <laughs> saw that once Walker took <laughs> took office, and now we got Dunleavy out there with the same sort of Parnell be happy approach. Um, and once we hit the election. Uh, uh, we're going to have we're going to have a much different situation that he's than he's painting on the campaign trail. So, well, and you're painting two different pictures. I mean, because you're you're, you're painting that again, the Parnell like thing, like every look at me, everything's fine. Don't nobody worry. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, or on the other hand, it could be kind of politics as usual because again, they're in front of I think it was ATIA, wasn't it? The, the travel yep. industry forum. So it's a travel industry forum. He's talking to a bunch of tourist people who were mad that they a lot. You know, look, you taxed us in the industry. You should spend that money. Walker, you know, canceled part of that through the appropriation process through the veto uh, taxes that historically have gone to back towards bolstering the travel industry. Uh, so I could definitely see this as being part of a um, oh. I'll tell you one thing and then do something else, kind of that whole pol politician thing. Or it could be more of just the, don't worry, it'll all be fine, it'll all work out. Uh, it's just a scratch, walk it off, uh, kind of thing. And um, I, it's a it's a tough deal. I, I, and uh, I think you're right. I think he needs to to start doing. It. He's got a healthy enough lead in the polls that I think that um, he could he could probably really avoid much damage if he was preparing Alaskans here, Brad. Uh, give me your final thoughts here in 40 seconds. Well, it's it, we, we, we've got to be honest with Alaskans. This this campaign needs to be honest with Alaskans. We, we went through a campaign in 2014 where we weren't honest with, with Alaskans about what the consequences were of oil price drops. We need to be we need to be uh, honest in this campaign, and Mike needs to step up to the plate uh, and do it. Um, he, he can't deliver everything, and my concern is when you get to Election Day, you, you've promised all these things. Something's got to give, and the question is what's going to give? Are we going to have PFD cuts? Or are we going to have taxes? Are we not going to refill the CBR? What's going to give? Uh, and and he just need, we need to be confronting that now during the campaign. We need to know what he's going to do as governor before we vote for him uh, and he's just not he's just not telling us brad keithley is our guest alaskans for sustainable budgets is uh, where he's from you could find links on my facebook page and on the uh, broadcast this morning on facebook live to his blog and to more we're going to return here in just a moment don't go anywhere it is the michael duke show you're open for common sense liberty-based free thinking radio brad, i mean i'm watching this thing right now with Dunleavy, and, and you and I talked about this last week, this idea of running out the clock and, and everything else. And I understand in a way what they're doing, but at the same time, this is not running out the clock. This is kind of pandering in some ways uh, to the industry. Like I said, I mean, standing in front of a, um, uh, you know, I, I, he's standing in front of a group of people that, that uh, you know, he's trying to get their support, trying to garner their support, but don't blow you know, don't blow wind up my skirt and tell me that this is this is all good stuff. I, I think that it's definitely problematic. It it is. And and it's just I mean, it's it's so unlike Mike, the, the Mike before the, the, the Mike before uh, sort of the middle of the campaign against uh, against Treadwell. It, it I mean, he was brutally honest. Uh, he talked about the Dunleavy plan, which had deep cuts. Uh, and then we sort of get to the middle ish and ish of the campaign against Treadwell, and it all starts starts turning um, in a different fashion. And you know that 4.3 number just you you think you're stunned uh, as I read to you parts of the ledge finance uh, uh, <laughs> paper. I was stunned when I when I saw that 4.3 number. Operating budget alone doesn't count capital. 4.3, and then so I read it in the ADN. I thought, okay, well maybe the ADN got it wrong. And then it's in. 
um, and then it's in uh, 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 APRN in the in the public uh, public news uh, 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 online article, and then you know he starts talking about it publicly. So I something somebody's convinced him of something about those numbers uh, that just doesn't make sense. But you can't let, let's let's get to you cannot deliver a 4.3 operating budget, add in capital to get to about a 4.5 billion dollar capital, and that's minimal capital, have a full PFD, um, uh, have no taxes, and do the CBR refill. You can't do all of those things. Right. So in in November, when he wakes up the day after the election, if he's elected, some one, one of those things, or maybe a combination of those things, are going to be are going to be something different than what he said on the on the campaign trail. And I, it, you know, he wrote an editorial that said, this campaign is all about rebuilding trust. Well, how do you rebuild trust when you when you talk about numbers that you know are not going to work the day after you get elected? Right, right. I uh, I I am a little concerned about again, kind of the posturing and the fact that he's avoiding a lot of the questions and and again, kind of you know running the clock out and everything else. Especially, and Harold just mentioned this in the chat room. This is something that I've been doing some reading on and trying to get some backstory on this uh, this rumor that's going around that there's going to be some kind of major October surprise that's being orchestrated by Vince Beltrami of the AFL-CIO uh, and others. We keep hearing about it, and I don't know if it's just a lot of wishful thinking or if they actually are going to try and pull something up here. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a little concerned that uh, if, you know, if he, do, if he self-destructs in, 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 a, in a way, it's definitely going to be bad for us in the long run. Yep. Yep. I. You know, I, uh, the numbers just aren't there. And, and I, uh, you know, if this were, if this were a Democrat doing this trick, you know, talking about numbers that don't balance out, we would be pillaring the heck, heck out of that person. Right. And, and from the standpoint of, of Alaskans for sustainable budgets, we're nonpartisan. So I, I feel an obligation to, to identify these issues, uh, with Dunleavy. It makes me, it makes me, uh, uh, concerned that that i have to do so because i think dunleavy has been the best candidate in the race but by god those those numbers just don't pan out as i say we have to get to a hundred dollar barrel oil uh average over a year not just touch it but average over a year to make all those numbers work yeah um and and we ain't going to get there so I, I i don't know what's going on with that campaign but i wish i wish it would take a different tack over the over the re remaining three weeks. Uh, we'll have to watch it and see. Brad Keith Lee is our guest. Brad, hold the line for just a second. Brad Keith Lee is our guest. We just got done with uh, number one of our weekly top three. I don't know. We're just going to have to pick it up, Brad, here. We're not even we're not even down to it. Let's uh, let's jump into uh, let's jump into number two of our weekly top three. Uh, and that one, of course, is, uh, you know, some of the races around the state of Alaska and one in particular that I think that you're focused on. I am. So, so this follows on from the first point. The first point is I'm concerned about Dunleavy and about, and about the direction that he's talking about for, for budget, for budget numbers that makes point number two is that makes the legislative races even more important. They've been important before because, because the legislature has to, has to agree with Dunleavy on re reestablishing uh, the PFD, the legislature, uh, if the legislature continues to cut the PFD, there's nothing Dunleavy can do about it. There's nothing a governor can do about it. A governor can't add dollars back to a budget. He can veto dollars out of a budget, right? but he can't add dollars back to a budget. So it's critically important that we elect legislators and have a legislature that is that is supportive and prepared to support uh, a governor who wants to to, to bring the PFD back to back to its uh, full level. I think I think the most critical race uh, in that regard um, and, and even more critical if Dunleavy is sort of wavering on what the numbers are or, or he's going to you know, have to make decisions, choices between the various campaign promises he's made. Uh, I think it's critical that we have legislators, a legislature that is going to be fiscally conservative. And I think the key race, the key race uh, in 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 establishing a fiscally conservative Senate, at least, is down in Dis District O in the Kenai, in the Kenai, where Ron Gillum's running a write-in campaign against Peter Machucky. 
Macheki, Macheki for years, in 2006, voted to cut the PFD, said that he was a profile encouraged for doing that, uh, that, uh, uh, that Governor Walker was courageous when when the legislature didn't cut the PFD, but when Walker stepped in and, and vetoed it. Um, and Machiki has continued to vote for PFD cuts, permanent PFD cuts, uh, uh, in, the, in the legislature since, including this year uh, uh, with, uh, with the cuts that, that they made to the PFD again uh, in the budget. Um, now, I know, uh, <laughs> talk about election year conversions, uh, Machiki has said that he has that he's having an election year conversion, and now he thinks he favors a a full PFD, uh, but we've seen this dog before, right? We've seen this show before. Kathy Giesel voted to cut the PFD in 2016 during her campaign against Bill, Vince Beltrami for the Senate in the in the fall of 2016, then cut an ad saying, oh, I'm in favor of a full PFD and I'll work with Mike Dunleavy to restore your PFD. Then the second she got back to Juneau uh, after being reelected, she voted to cut the PFD again. So. We've seen this. We've seen this story about election year conversions before, and I don't think Peter Machecki's any more Peter Machecki's conversion is any more convincing than uh, uh, than than Kathy Giesel's was. And and here's the thing: we've got four probably really good, solid cons- fiscal conservatives uh, that are either already in or on their way on their way back to the Senate. Uh, Mike Shower, uh, Senator Mike Shower, Senator Shelley Hughes. Probably Senator Laura Reinbold, likely Senator Laura Reinbold, uh, and Senator David Wilson, also from the Valley. Those are probably four really rock solid conservatives. Four is not the magic number, though. Five's the magic number. If if the Democrats hold their five, and you get five rock solid conservatives that, like Shower and Hughes, are willing to sit out of the caucus um, uh, in order to to make their point and become must need votes, must have votes. Uh, on budget issues, uh, then you've really got something in the legislature that's going to back up Dunleavy, that's going to be supportive of restoring the full PFD. The one seat that we can pick up to get that rock-solid five uh, is in Senate District O, Ron Gillum's race against Peter Machecki. If Gillum can win that race, add a fifth conservative center, senator uh, to uh, to the that conservative that conservative caucus that you can see out there, uh, then then I think we've got a really a really good shot in the legislature to back up Dunleavy on the full PFD and back him up on on making the hard decisions he's going to have to make to to get spending down. If we don't get that, if we don't get that fifth vote, I'm concerned that we're going to see the same Senate that we had last year, which which will talk a good game like Machecki does. They'll talk a good game, but when but when push comes to shove, They'll pull the the lever that says PFD cuts before they do anything else, and we're just back to ground zero. And even with Dunleavy, Dunleavy as governor, uh, since he can't add money back to the budget, uh, we're back to ground zero. The legislature will, if the legislature says PFD cuts, then it will be PFD cuts, uh, and we'll be going down the same road that we've been going down for the past uh, past two years. So Dunleavy being squishy on numbers, campaigning now on squishy numbers. Uh, makes me even more focused uh, on 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 that Senate District O uh, uh, race and uh, and and the potential to pick up a fiscally conservative uh, legislator over there by replacing uh, Machecki with Ron Gillum. I, I had an interesting conversation. Somebody uh, called me yesterday, uh, kind of a, one of the people that I know that are more of a political animal, and and they were trying to convince me that that this is no that he's changed that uh, Machiki has changed and that he's seen the light, that this is why he's working on this PFT enshrinement. That's why he's doing this. That's why he tried to, you know, reach across and talk with Clem Tillian and do all these other things. And, and he's seen the light, and he's in, but only by sending him back because he's in line to be, you know, uh, in leadership and all these other things that that's that we need to send him back because otherwise it will just not be the – it just won't work because Gillum would have – no seniority and no experience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is your response to those arguments? Well, two things. One, l- let me cue up the Kathy Giesel ad for you and just and just run it over and over and over and over in your face. Uh, and where she says, well, I'm going to work with Mike Dunleavy to restore your PFD. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and after a while, maybe you'll, maybe you'll understand that election year conversions just aren't, uh, aren't, 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 aren't worth aren't worth the, the paper or the video that they're they're printed on. Um, 
And the second thing is seniority isn't seniority is important uh, down in Juneau, but it's not the be all and end all. Really, caucus numbers are the be all and end all. And if uh, if you get five fiscal conservatives who like Mike Shower and Shelley Hughes are willing to stand. Uh, on their principles and willing to say, no, we're not comfortable with committing our vote in advance on a budget that we don't know what it's going to be, uh, and we're going to we're going to you know form this conservative caucus. Um, uh, it, that's where the power is going to be. We've seen this in the legislature before. It's been a couple of decades since we've had sort of that standout caucus, uh, uh, but you uh, you can go back in history and see times when there's been that third caucus and the power the power that third caucus has had. So. Um, I think that uh, uh, I think that where the real power is is in getting a fifth member uh, to that conservative caucus, making it the 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 crossroads through which all votes have to go, uh, and 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 empowering them to to say no, we're not we're not voting for anything if it doesn't cut cut spending. That's that's the real power. So and Macheki's Macheki's not going to go there. Uh, uh, Macheki's not going to not going to stand in the road. He, if Pete Kelly's returned, Mia Costello, if she's returned, Kathy Geisel's there, John Coghill's there. They're all going to go. Down, they're all going to keep going down this same road of PFD cuts. Oh, we don't want to do it. It's horrible. Oh, it's the last thing we want to do, but we're doing it. <laughs> and um, then, and then, of course, take a victory lap selfie while patting themselves on the back, telling people what yeah. a hard job that they had to do. Um, yeah. And again, I'm, I'm with you on that. Down to the last uh, two minutes or so, Brad, I know you wanted to get to the final one, and this is the one that I've noticed uh, has been picked up now. They're talking about taxation issues. Jared Kushner's come up. Uh, this has an effect, though, you say, on all Alaskans. Let, let's hit that quickly. So so there's there's been a press report that Jared Kushner, uh, President Trump's son-in-law advisor to President Trump, paid no taxes, has paid no taxes for several years, using various loopholes to, to, to you know, reduce his tax burden to zero. Uh, I think that's a story not so much. I'm not challenging Jerry Kushner or challenging Trump. This isn't this isn't a way of, ta- of attacking Trump. This is a way of highlighting uh, what economists call and, and tax lawyers call tax expenditures, but which the common common people call and I call uh, tax loopholes. Tax loopholes uh, account for more than a trillion dollars in lost revenue every year. In fact, it's a trillion and a half. If we didn't have loopholes, two things would happen. The deficit would disappear. Uh, the deficit this year is about $750 billion. Tax loopholes are worth a, a trillion and a half. Um, so not only could we close the deficit, eliminate the deficit, but we actually could reduce tax rates for everybody else uh, by an additional amount uh, because we wouldn't need – uh, the additional revenue, we would need some of it to start to start reducing the debt, but we wouldn't need all of it. Um, and so, tax loopholes are are really, I mean, they're they're really the the elephant in the fiscal room, right? They are in the federal fiscal room. They are the thing that, if you addressed it and and stopped it, uh, would would really solve the nation's uh, fiscal crisis. The thing with Jared Kushner is, I, I'm sure Jared Kushner was entitled to all those loopholes that lobbyists had arranged uh, for him and others over the years. I'm sure everything he did was was approved by his tax lawyer and tax accountant, and I'm sure it's all appropriate. But the point is, we've got people out there, people with very high incomes, right. paying zero right. in taxes, while the rest of us are paying high tax rates. Well, and I think that's the thing. If I could take loopholes, I would do it too. I think we've got to simplify the tax code overall, and I, I think there's some definitely some deeper issues here. But we're out of time. Brad Keithley, thank you so much for coming on board and joining us. Michael, thanks as always for having me. Out. Um, I, you know, I'll tell you, Brad, I read this story, and again, I think it's a non-story from the standpoint of, look, Kirshner took, you know, he took, he, he took advantage of the tax laws. Well, yeah, he took advantage of the tax laws. That's, that's what happens when you, when you work. I mean, you take advantage of the tax laws that are available to you. He didn't do anything illegal. Nobody's asserting that he did anything illegal. It's kind of this real big salacious story about how he took advantage of the tax code. Good God, if I could, I would as well. Um, I think it's also a story of just basically saying, you know, we need a simplified tax code. If it wasn't yeah. so damn complicated, uh, there wouldn't be all these loopholes. If it wasn't, so, if it wasn't, you know, forty thousand, you know, tons of paper for a single tax code, we wouldn't have to deal with that. 
Yeah, I it's it's I, it's not it's not just that it's complicated. It's not just that we create these things, Michael. It's having real world consequences in terms of making everybody else. So we've got seven hundred. We, we, we've got this huge friggin' deficit. We got seven hundred fifty billion dollar deficit this year. We're going to go over one trillion dollars, according to the Trump administration. We're going to go over one trillion dollars uh, in deficit uh, next year. Those are huge. Huge issues, huge problems. We're passing this burden down to future future generations, and they exist. When you when you get into it and you analyze tax expenditures, they exist entirely because we've got these loopholes. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, I don't begrudge Jared Kushner taking advantage of them. I don't begrudge anybody taking advantage of them. The problem is they're on the books, and the problem is the result is they're forcing everybody else to pay a little bit more. If we got those loopholes off, we could reduce rates. Everybody else to pay a little bit more to, to make up for those loopholes. And they're creating the deficit that pushes the burden uh, down to future generations. Uh, and the loopholes are nothing more. I mean, I've lived this life for however many years I've, I've been around this stuff. The loopholes are nothing more than lobbyists going in, knowing Congress, knowing people in Congress or staff, spinning a good story about how oh, this loophole will create a public good by X, Y, Z, um, and Congress going, oh, let's see, they gave us you know $500,000 in campaign contributions. Yeah, that, that's a good story. Let's run with that. <laughs> uh, and, 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 creating the, and creating these loopholes. That's Yeah, well, it, 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 even if we give them more money, Brad, they're just going to spend more anyway. I mean, at this point, the whole thing is so busted, I don't even know, and I agree with you, but at the same time, the more you give them, the more they spend. So you, if you if you gave them enough, you took out all, every loophole, and they gained an extra trillion dollars in revenue. They'd spend another trillion on top of that because they could. I mean, well, you, maybe so. You and I both know that. I mean, because that is the nature of what's going on right now. Because there is no penalty for any of what they're doing right now. There is no pain. It's all some future thing. It's all some fictional thing that's coming one day, maybe someday down the road, not on my watch. And that's 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 how they look at it. But but the system we've created has some people with very high incomes, Jerry, Jared Kushner being a, a poster child for it, if nothing else. Some people with very high incomes paying zero toward the cost of government, while you, me, everybody else that's listening to this program are paying at least something. Right. Uh, toward the cost of government, while, while Kushner pays zero. That's not an equitable system. We say we've got a progressive tax system in the country. I don't like progressive taxes. I prefer flat taxes. But we say we've got a progressive uh, tax system in the country. We really don't. Right. I mean, we've got some people at the top end, like Kushner, who are paying zero. And, some, and, and, and that is less than a lot of people in the middle income level is paying. We're at right. least paying no, something toward it. I agree that. I mean, I agree that some of these things are kind of heinous. Uh, you know, I think we, the, the system is so fundamentally broken at this point, it kind of needs to be revamped from the ground up. But I am definitely with you on that. A flat tax would definitely simplify the tax code. I'm totally down with that. Let's make it happen. Um, <laughs> all right, Brad, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, folks can find you over at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets on Facebook. And I am looking forward to this eight-point piece of crap. I mean, this paper that is uh, you're going to post later. I really think we should probably do something on that if you have time. Uh, I think to be able to dissect that, we need to do a whole you know segment or or a couple segments on that. And maybe we can just do a special podcast after hours for that. So if you're up for that, I'm up for it. Yeah, I look forward to it. And that's a great. That's a great. It's a great tool to use for a for a podcast because it gives you know it, it tells us exactly what Juno what 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 the staff and Juno are thinking and then gives us the ability to rebut it thanks uh, for having me Mike hey, Brad I really appreciate it thanks for calling and joining us Brad Keithley Alaskans for sustainable budget well that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for sustainable budgets thank you again for joining us remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.